Welcome to session number 13 of an introduction to biblical prophecy. I'm Dr. John McMath. I'm joined here by uh, friends in the Philippines and in Italy and uh, around this country. Uh, folks on uh, YouTube and Facebook uh, can find this stuff, and we get several hundred every week. Um, all over the place, not not just in Italy and the Philippines, but they're they're everywhere. It's amazing who joins this. Uh, this week we'll be continuing this introduction to prophecy again with a broad view, and this lecture introduces a, a series of lectures that will probably take us a, a full two sessions, maybe three sessions. It depends on how much I. I dump into each one. <laughs> yes, this is a big idea. Uh, today's uh, uh, lesson introduces the concept of the biblical covenants. Okay, and and we all have a, a kind of a foggy notion of what this means. Uh, but the uh, the biblical covenants are an important part of the overall structure of uh, uh, the outworking of God's plan. Uh, a, a covenant is a kind of an agreement, and uh, uh, it's not a contract exactly. Uh, and sometimes the word is translated testament, as in Old Testament and New Testament, like a will. And that really isn't a good translation. The Hebrew word is barit, uh, and it uh, it comes from a root that means to. Uh, to cut something in two. Uh, uh, literally, uh, when kings would make a treaty with one another, they would cut animals and lay them on opposite sides of a path and walk through that line of animals, dead animals and all the blood and whatnot. Um, and they walk through the, 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 uh, the path together uh, and uh, uh, sign a couple of treaties uh, which would go home to the temples of their gods, and the armies would be watching, and you know peace would break out. Uh, and that's where the word comes from. But in the Bible, uh, this uh, uh, this word has uh, a very specific meaning, uh, and the uh, the covenants are not everywhere, uh, and they're very specifically structured, uh, and they form. Uh, kind of a an outline of the progress of revelation. Uh, so we start off with a uh, a kind of a covenant, kind of a proto covenant, because it, it really lacks some of the main features uh, in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve, having been created, uh, get a commission from God: uh, you know, uh, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Uh, and all of that, uh, the uh, we we call it sometimes the Edenic covenant, uh, and this is not a this is not the theological covenant of works that's uh, hypothesized by the Reformed tradition. Uh, instead, it just looks at what the Bible actually says. Uh, there was no uh, covenant of salvation by works. Uh, uh, Adam and Eve were, were created uh, conditionally holy, we say. Uh, and they would have just stayed holy and spent eternity with God. Uh, so there was no salvation needed. But once they fell, there was no covenant of works. Uh, there was no way to recover from the fall without the grace of God. So salvation by grace has always been the case from the very beginning. There was never any other way. So there's there's no two different ways of salvation. Uh, it was one of the reasons that I, I don't like working with uh, a reformed structure because it just, it ignores too many of the details. But then I guess that's a feature too. <laughs> so some people like a simple structure. Uh, when uh, when we look at the covenants, uh, and uh, we're going to look at seven of them, 
uh, the key seven covenants. We can say that there are some other covenants, but they, for the most part, lack the they lack the features that we're looking for. Uh, I'll walk you through that in just a second. So we're going to see seven of them, and they're they're different from uh, the theological dispensational structure. The dispensational structure is related to the covenant structure. And I think you'll see how as I as I start opening this up. Uh, and the the dispensations often are accompanied by uh, a uh, a covenant, uh, but it doesn't always quite work that way. Uh, so I'm going to show you what the Bible actually does, and we'll we'll deal with any difficult difficulties as they come up. Um, I prefer to use biblical language instead of theological language. So that's kind of where I am. Let's uh, let's open up the uh, the share. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Share the screen. Yada yada yada. No, that's not the one I want. This is the one I want. Is it the one I want? I think this is the one I want. Okay, let's see what's coming up on my other screen. There it is. Okay, this is an introduction to biblical prophecy and the biblical covenant structure of God's plan. Let's see if I can get this thing out of my way. There we go. Uh, over there on the right, you'll see a you'll see a structure complete with a uh, with a uh, pulley system to lift stuff up. Uh, so if you're building a building, you want to start at the bottom and move your way up. So the, the little blocks go at the top and the foundational blocks go at the bottom. And the foundational blocks have to be there even though they're not the whole building. Uh, and along the way, you know, during the progress of the building, uh, the the blocks pile on one another until all together they form a whole. We can think of the unfolding of God's uh, program for mankind and for the universe as a whole as a construction project. Uh, and God is building this uh, one carefully cut block at a time. And so the block is laid down, and suddenly we realize, oh, that's the corner of a building. Uh, isn't that nice? Well, wow, that shows that uh, this wall goes this way, and this wall goes that way. We've got an actual corner, and uh, it's obviously going to be big because that's a great big block. Uh, and we learn something about what it, God is intending to do by looking at the first block. When the second block goes in place, we learn something more and so on. As each bit of the progressive revelation happens, we learn more. The unfolding of the biblical covenant uh, has that effect. Uh, and along the way, uh, dispensational changes happen, uh, but not for not for every uh, dispensation quite. It's just, it, it, it's, I'll, I'll show you as we get into this. You'll see what I mean uh, by all of that. Let's do some definitions. Let's see if I can make this go to the next cut. Ooh, there we go. So a definition uh, in the Bible, not, not in the ancient Near East, although that's where, that's the background. Uh, but in the Bible, a covenant is an agreement between God and his people that imposes specific obligations and specific benefits. So we've got covenant obligations. There are some things that each party is going to do, and there are some benefits usually to both parties. Uh, and we, uh, we can see this in all of the, uh, all of the covenant structures. Uh, the, the second part of this is uh, really interesting, uh, and this, I, I haven't listed this here, but the, the covenant can be either conditional or unconditional. If it's a conditional covenant, uh, it, uh, it has a, an if-then kind of structure. 
if you do this thing, then you will be thus and such and blessed in such and such a way. Uh, on the other hand, if you fail to do this thing, uh, then you will be cursed with such and such a curse. So the blessing and the curse and the, uh, the option, uh, the if-then, the, the conditionality makes it a conditional covenant. And lots of, uh, lots of agreements that people make uh, are in the nation, nature of a conditional covenant. Uh, uh, if, uh, uh, if you make the payments on this car, then you can keep the car. <laughs> and by extension, if you don't make the payments, uh, the repo man will come out and take it uh, and uh, your car will be gone. Um, and uh, that's a uh, uh, that's a very normal thing, and lots of covenants that we make, or more like contracts that people make today, uh, are in the uh, form of a conditional covenant. An unconditional covenant is in the nature of a promise, uh, and you can usually see a conditional covenant with. Uh, with a straight up promise, uh, I will bless you, make your name great. Uh, uh, you shall be the father of many nations and so on. Uh, when, uh, when God says a thing without an if clause, then that is a unconditional or an unconditional covenant. And the, uh, uh, the important or the, you know, what really uh, should be the key uh, Old Testament covenants are unconditional. Uh, they're just they're laid out as uh, as a promise, usually to Israel. Not always, but usually strictly to Israel. And we'll see how that works as we look at the uh, uh, the list of the things. Uh, a covenant is also a kind of a kinship bond. The uh, scholars will call this a sacred kinship bond uh, between uh, two or more parties. Usually two parties is ratified by the swearing of an oath. Uh, and, uh, this is the kind of thing that happens very seldom today. Uh, in the ancient world, covenants, though, were quite common. Uh, landowners, for, for example, would make a covenant with the working people who lived on the land. We would think of them as uh, uh, peasants or uh, serfs. Uh, and they, uh, the, the landowner uh, would, would undertake, having purchased the land, uh, to provide uh, defense and a uh, and a living for the people who worked on the land. In return, the uh, the peasants who lived there would provide uh, food and other services for the landowner. Uh, and this was a mutually beneficial uh, covenant. And the uh, uh, the landowner and uh, his uh, tenants. Uh, operated like family, uh, and that was fairly common. Uh, uh, friendship in ancient times was often expressed in covenant terms. Uh, here in uh, uh, America, uh, before uh, the Europeans came, uh, the Indians who lived here we, we called them Indians. They were, they were the, the native folks who, who lived here uh, would uh, uh, make a, a covenant with one another uh, by uh, cutting one another's wrists and bonding them together so that they could share some blood. And they uh, considered themselves blood brothers. Uh, the interesting thing, I, I'm not sure that that is a real thing, but that's how it's uh, how it's said. Uh, in the secular world, kings would make covenants of peace and cooperation, kind of treaty. Uh, and uh, they would seal that covenant with a marriage. Well, why? 
you know, they, they would send daughters or other close relatives uh, to the other king to, uh, to make a marriage. Uh, and the thinking was that then we become family. Uh, we become brothers or brothers-in-law or uncles or whatever, <laughs> whatever the relationship might be. And uh, it's less likely for brothers to go to war with one another than for strangers. And that's, that's why uh, kings in the ancient world often had uh, a lot of wives because most of them were political wives. Uh, they were the, uh, these, and it, it kind of takes, it takes a lot of the edge off uh, the notion of, uh, of kinship and family and all of that when you've got 22 wives. But nevertheless, that's what, that's what that was. It was a covenant uh, sealed with the oath of marriage. In the modern world, the only real vestige of the covenant relationship uh, is uh, marriage. And uh, uh, for many people, marriage is not a covenant. There is no promise sealed with an oath as sacred before God. Uh, uh, people just go, go down to the justice of the peace and sign some paperwork, and now they're married, and two weeks later they can get unmarried. The uh, same justice of the peace will sign a divorce decree, uh, and uh, uh, nobody cares. Uh, but uh, uh, conservative people, Christian people, really ought to care. Uh, marriage is a sacred covenant. Uh, we stand before God and make promises to one another, to God, and to our witnesses. That's marriage is actually a really big deal because it is, in fact, the last of the uh, covenant relationships that really exists in the in the uh, big wide world. So a man and a woman enter this covenant of marriage, and they promise a faithfulness to one another. Uh, and assuming obligations to one another. And in this way, they become family. So God's covenants with Israel treat her as family. Now, as we get farther into this, uh, we're going to see that this family relationship defines the relationship between God and the people of Israel. Uh, and we're all Christians, so we're, we're wondering at this point, well, what difference does that make for me? Well, we'll see as we get farther in, because many of these covenants have a universal uh, extent. So, for example, in the Edenic covenant, uh, there are some principles laid down that are universal and eternal, uh, that uh, don't change because of uh, religious disagreement or uh, something like that. Uh, the, uh, the principles that are laid down are there forever, uh, and uh, we just have to live with them. Uh, so the obligations of the of any covenant as we unwrap them uh, in the Old Testament uh, are usually laid out in what we call stipulations. So what kind of uh, obligations do you have? So as uh, uh, when Donna and I got married, uh, I remember very well <laughs> because I've, I've used the same words over and over throughout uh, these decades of, uh, of ministry, marrying other people. Uh, to uh, to love and to cherish, uh, to uh, uh, honor uh, and respect uh, from this day forward, in sickness and in health. You know, to death till uh, till death do us part. You, remember, you maybe you've had some similar words. Uh, we make promises uh, before God in this company. That it's a uh, those stipulations. Uh, are uh, the elements of the agreement that we make. So God's 
uh, covenant with Israel are very much like that. Uh, the uh, privileges of the covenant, along with the stipulations, the obligations of the covenant, uh, are made clear, usually in some ritual or ceremonial way. And you can see a covenant when when you're reading it through Scripture. You'll you'll spot the covenants because of the the way they're laid out and the way they uh, the way the language works. So let's. Uh, Go on to the next one. Let's see if I can make this work. Ooh, there it goes. Uh, I thought the snake was kind of cute. Uh, we, we've already looked at the uh, the Proto-Evangelion, the uh, uh, introduction of the redemption program and the kingdom program that happens in uh, Genesis 3. Uh, God uh, made, a, made a curse on uh, the man, on the woman, and on the snake. And as he's cursing the snake, I says, uh, uh, you will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. The heel strike is predictive of the whole redemption program. We call it a program because it's not a single event. Uh, there are redemptive elements all the way through the Old Testament. Uh, and this unfolds as we head toward the New Testament. It's a long story. The kingdom program is the same sort of thing. God has always been the king. Uh, but there are unfolding elements of the kingdom uh, as we head toward the climax where uh, sin is destroyed, death is destroyed, Satan himself is cast into the pit, uh, and it's all over. And we see a, uh, an advance in what we call the progressive revelation of God's plans. Uh, and so the covenants uh, advance, sometimes redemptive, uh, redemptive truth, sometimes kingdom truth, uh, and they uh, they all look forward to the fulfillment, which doesn't come until the end of time. So this is a very long uh, thing. The uh, uh, the covenant structure is not something that can be understood as uh, say God's agreement with Abraham, and nobody else is in on this. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, the covenants tend to be uh, long-lasting and very uh, permanent things. Now, there are some that people call covenants that are not so long-lasting. I'll show you how that works. Okay. Um, no, 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 no. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next one. Uh, the third idea here with covenants is that they tend to be principal teaching object lessons. Uh, an object lesson is uh, a, a really helpful thing when you're teaching little kids. Uh, you you want, to, uh, want them to remember it. And so you, uh, you pick out an illustration uh, that works well. Uh, and uh, sometimes you, you pick a kid out of the, the audience. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, my iPad is getting ready to disappear here. <laughs> here we go. Now it, no, it will be fine. All right. <laughs> uh, so you pick out an object lesson. Let's see. Um, you know, see this glass? I'm going to put some water in it. Is this half empty or half full? And then you go on from there to teach a lesson. Uh, an object lesson gives uh, gives people something um, tactile, something they can touch, something they can think about, some some focus. And the uh, uh, the covenants tend to lay out specific uh, object lessons for Israel. Uh, the uh, covenant relationships are designed to teach by experience. Uh, certain foundational truths uh, upon which all godly human society is built. 
a, a lot of the biblical covenants relate to the redemption ideas. Uh, not all, uh, and uh, many of them do. And these will point to the work of Christ uh, and to the faith of God's people. There are also kingdom ideas uh, concerning the evil of sin and the blessing of walking with the king, which are found in most of the covenant passages. Uh, and there's a progressive revelation of these principles. And so the object lesson will come up again and again and again, uh, perhaps in a different uh, 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 different uh, costume. <laughs> but it turns out it's the same object lesson. There's a limited number of these primary principles uh, that uh, spreads out all through scripture all right let me see if i can make another one go okay um so how do the covenants relate to biblical prophecy uh, the old testament prophets consistently look back to the foundation covenant relationships that are established in the pentateuch and in the the books of the Kings and Samuel, uh, the the foundational stuff uh, is uh, is laid down. Uh, the uh, universal principles are all laid down um, in the uh, in the Pentateuch, uh, and then these are objectified during the lives of the kings. The prophets look back. And most of the prophets are are doing what uh, some scholars have called a uh, jazz riff uh, on the Pentateuch. So they look at the theme in the Pentateuch, and they go on to do variations on that theme, looking forward into history, first at the life of Christ, uh, the 30 years that he was actually on earth. Uh, and so the redemptive activity of Christ, uh, uh, living a perfect life, doing the miracles, uh, uh, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, uh, riding a donkey, uh, taken to the cross, all, all of the things that we look at in the Gospels as a fulfillment of prophecy uh, are actually fulfillments of interpretations that the prophets have made of uh, Moses and the uh, history of Israel. The object lessons that play out the principles of the Pentateuch in the lives of the kings and of the, uh, the people of Israel during those years form the foundation for uh, this expansion of revelation and the uh, the prophets are saying we know what what happened to uh, uh, to Moses and to Aaron and to the uh, to, we know what the people of Israel did and how they sinned here and how God sent a salvation there and so on uh, and uh, this points us forward to the coming of a perfect king the coming of a sinless king the coming of a uh, uh, of a king who is willing to die for the sins of his people who will fulfill his kinship covenant relationship with his own people uh, by going to the cross uh, so there is all of that that's going on but the the prophets also look beyond the earthly life of christ toward the kingdom that is yet to come uh, and the uh, the new testament does the same thing uh, the new testament says here we are in the life of christ is it built on what we know of uh, of the prophets and uh, what was laid down in the beginning by uh, moses and the historians uh, and this uh, life of christ has led to uh, the redemption of mankind, Israel first, uh, and also to the Gentiles. But there is yet to come a consummation in the kingdom that is yet to come. 
Uh, so all of these things are are developed in the prophets, and we have to understand the the prophetic future as as being the outworking of what uh, God has already revealed. So from the very beginning, God sees the end. He speaks through Moses, the historians, the poets, and the prophets uh, to reveal the stages and the uh, and the variations within his uh, his program. Um, dum, 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 dum. Um, yeah, consistent themes tend to be built into uh, all of the prophets uh, because they're true. Uh, and the unity of scripture is finally upheld. Uh, we've got a historical unfolding of all these different elements. Uh, and when we take the whole Bible as a whole, we find that a single story is being told and it's unfolding slowly over all the centuries by, and uh, revealed in the Bible. All right, let me get to this next one. Not doing too bad. Okay, this is a this is a bunch of steps in a, a church in England called uh, Wells Cathedral, and I've always liked these steps. Uh, so, so here they are. <laughs> so are some steps, uh, and the uh, the covenant names are in the wrong order, and there's only six of them. But uh, here they are. Uh, the the earliest of the uh, covenants, and I, and I put air quotes around it, it's called the Edenic uh, covenant, sometimes the Adamic covenant for Adam, uh, but I prefer Edenic. Uh, the Edenic covenant is not a real covenant, uh, but it does contain uh, the, uh, the promises, uh, and uh, it involves the creation of man, uh, and there are certain very specific uh, obligations and benefits that are laid out. The uh, uh, the element of the the one rule in the garden, you know, don't eat from this particular fruit, is actually a fairly minor part of that covenant, but uh, important in uh, some other ways because that's that's what leads to uh, the possibility of the fall. Uh, and uh, uh, the Edenic Covenant uh, opens up uh, a, a group of eternally true propositions. Uh, like man is created male and female. <laughs> that's that's just true. It doesn't. It really doesn't matter what, uh, uh, frankly, the perverts think. Uh, uh, people who have problems being either male or female uh, are are kind of wrong in the head. They're they're sick, uh, and uh, that doesn't mean they're necessarily evil people. But they've got they're not normal. They've got a serious problem, and normal is the recognition that there are boy type people and there are girl type people, and that marriage exists for the propagation of the race, and that's it's an important relationship, and the only uh, licit relationship between a man and a woman. Uh, that's as part of that, and we'll look at that all by itself in the next slide. Uh, the Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah, uh, is an important one. It happens at the end of the biblical flood. So we're in Genesis chapters 6 through 9. And the covenant uh, relationship is described in chapter 9 of uh, Genesis. Uh, three chapters later, we see Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant uh, is uh, like the others, uh, like like the Eden covenant and Noah's covenant, uh, is unconditional. Uh, and uh, God says, uh, Abraham, uh, uh, go, leave your father's house and so on. Go to the place I'm going to show you, uh, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. All of that happens here, and this is a this is an I will kind of covenant. Uh, this is not 
uh, conditional on the going. God already knew that Abraham was going. The uh, the covenant is probably made uh, in Haran, halfway to the promised land. Uh, probably was not, the call probably didn't happen in uh, Ur, probably happened in Haran in the northern Mesopotamia Valley. Just a detail for those who care. And that, uh, that covenant started Abraham's relationship with God. Uh, changes everything. Uh, the next covenant doesn't open up until uh, the beginning of uh, Exodus. And really, Exodus 19 and 20 is the, the first real statement of the so-called Mosaic covenant. You know, if you will be my people and walk in my ways and in my statutes and keep these commandments that I give you today, then you will be uh, my own special treasure, a kingdom of priests. Okay, that's that's Genesis 19 or Exodus 19. Uh, and this Mosaic covenant uh, is... Uh, really important in the sequence because it's a conditional covenant. Uh, and, uh, it's also important because it's not a salvation covenant. You know, none of them really are. Uh, the, uh, the covenant uh, primarily have to do uh, with uh, uh, kingdom elements. The redemption elements are almost always secondary. But the Mosaic Covenant is made with already saved people, or it's only really valid for saved people. Uh, the Davidic Covenant comes quite a bit later. This is the covenant that God makes with David in uh, First Samuel or Second Samuel 7. Yeah, in Second Samuel trying to remember my own my own notes uh, and the the covenant with David is a promise of an eternal kingdom uh, which can be difficult to understand because David didn't live forever neither did Solomon uh, so who is he talking about well we'll, we'll get there uh, then finally in the prophets uh, Jeremiah who writes, at the very end of the kingdom of Israel, uh, uh, gets a revelation from God that uh, uh, one day there will be a new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and the house of uh, Jacob. Uh, no more will a man say to his brother, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the greatest to the least. Uh, and this is a promise of redemption uh, to Israel. The new covenant is specifically a promise uh, to Israel. We'll get there and walk all through that. Uh, and I think we'll see how this works. The When we put all of these covenant structures together and lay out the, the principles uh, the eternally true principles, we're going to see the basic structure of salvation and the basic structure of uh, the messianic kingdom. It's all laid out here in these covenants, which take the form of specific promises. Uh, the, the one conditional uh, covenant in the pile is the Mosaic covenant, and it fits also into uh, uh, both uh, redemptive and kingdom principles. So we'll see how that works as we as we take these apart. Some of these we're going to spend quite a bit more time with than others. Uh, but uh, we'll we'll go ahead and start this off. What time have I got? Yes, I think we can do this. Let's start off with uh, the the first of the covenants. Uh, and you know, I, I kind of like cartoon Adam and Eve's. Uh, they're they're getting very serious here with a snake in the background and deciding whether or not to uh, have lunch together. You know, <laughs> yeah. Wait, do you like apples? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, Genesis two. 
uh, and uh, verses 3 through 25, really the, the whole passage there, uh, is the key to what's going on here. There's um, a, a single rule, you know, don't eat from the tree in the midst of the garden. That That's it. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing. Let, let me walk through all of the evidence here. Uh, this is often uh, in the literature spoken of as a covenant, even though it doesn't have uh, uh, the I will stuff or the uh, uh, there's no if then uh, structure. So it, uh, it's apparently unconditional, but it doesn't have a lot of the covenant language. Nevertheless, there's there's some things that uh, there's some principles that are laid down here that are eternal. And the first one uh, is that uh, human life comes directly from God. Uh, Adam started out as a pile of dirt. Uh, his name, Adama, means literally dirt or soil. Uh, so the name Adam uh, is not particularly complimentary. It means dirt boy. You know, I formed you from the mud and you're, 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 you're my dirt boy. And God directly breathed life into Adam. He breathed the breath of life into Adam. So Adam's life was, in fact, God's life. Uh, we know from uh, a study of uh, biology uh, that life doesn't just happen. It's not, a, life isn't spontaneously generated. Uh, living things come from other living things. Uh, when you plant a seed, the potential of life is in the seed. The seed itself is alive uh, and uh, maybe dormant for a long time, but when you plant it, uh, it uh, it takes on a life of its own, and it begins to grow, and it makes fruit and all of the rest. But that life comes from life, uh, and there is no there is no spontaneous generation of life from non-living things. So Adam's life, and by extension Eve's life, uh, came from God directly from God, uh, and there there was no uh, there there was no middle passage. Uh, the uh, fact is that man is a kind of godlike creature created by God, but with God's actual life. And, and that part is um, that's extremely important. Uh, if we try to believe that uh, that man is just, one more animal, a, a kind of glorified monkey, or uh, uh, just one more nothing of a of a, uh, a lower life form. Uh, then it's easier to to murder one another. It's, uh, abortion becomes no big deal because you're only killing a lump of cells that aren't anything, and that life is not special. Uh, but if we realize that life is a gift of God, then the life that we share with the rest of the human race comes from God. Uh, and uh, uh, that life is, by definition, sacred. Uh, uh, that forms a, a, an intellectual divide uh, between people in the modern world. Uh, when uh, when we talk about the uh, here in the West, uh, the uh, the question of abortion always comes up, and it, it tends to be divided along religious lines, uh, because religious people believe that there is a God and that our life comes from God. Therefore, life is sacred; you shouldn't murder. Um, the non-believing world has no such qualms. There is no God. Uh, the only important thing is that I be happy with whatever I do. And so everything is relative to my own personal happiness. Uh, so if I want to kill somebody, including my baby, uh, it's not a big deal as long as it makes me happy. Uh, this, is a, this is a very evil 
uh, point of view, but that's not the main point of this passage. The main point of this passage is that we respect each other uh, as uh, uh, living beings made in the image of God, and we share God's life. The second real big point here is that uh, the garden is a place that was beautiful, and it had everything that Adam needed to live productively and to thrive. And so the garden was a very productive place. There were no weeds. Uh, he, he was given uh, a wife who was exactly right for him. Uh, she was different from him, but complementary. Uh, she, uh, she was exactly what he needed. He was exactly what she needed. Uh, and all of the uh, motivations and uh, and the, frankly, the plumbing existed there in the garden for the propagation of life and for the uh, fulfilling of the command to be fruitful. Uh, this was this was a good place and a good beginning for Adam. So uh, Adam was given work to do. He was supposed to keep the garden. Uh, we don't know how big the garden was. Uh, it was uh, big enough to provide a full-time job for him, uh, but it wasn't all that hard uh, because there were no weeds. There were no uh, insects eating the uh, leaves and the fruit. Uh, so it was not a terrible job, and it would have been rewarding. Uh, Adam was to be a steward of God. Uh, he had a stewardship or a manager's responsibility over uh, the the whole earth. Uh, and God said, uh, uh, be, uh, be fruitful and uh, multiply and uh, uh, fill the earth and uh, 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 subject it, make it productive. Uh, so to, to make the earth productive means uh, learn how to cut down trees and build things. Uh, learn how to dig in the ground to find uh, minerals of various kinds that you can produce into manufactured goods that will be useful for other people. Uh, make things, uh, grow things, mine things, uh, catch things, whatever. Uh, uh, man's work was to be productive on the earth, not to just sit and soak, uh, but to have work to do. Uh, the only rule that is provided here uh, is the rule not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thou shalt not. Okay, for in the day that thou eatest it, you shall surely die. Okay, uh, very simple. A very specific prohibition. Uh, so, uh, the idea is of almost uh, total freedom. The basic principle is not control over man, but freedom. This is something I, I, I need to emphasize uh, because most, particularly non-Christian people who read the Bible, see nothing but a code of laws, whole bunch of requirements of how you got to live as a limit on my freedom. All oh, this says, you know, don't murder. That means I, I can't murder people. And I says, don't steal. And I really like stealing stuff. Um, and they see this as a limit. Uh, God intends the rule as an encouragement to freedom. And real freedom always has at least some limits. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we call this apodictic law, the prohibition of a certain particular thing means that everything else is free. Uh, you know, in a school zone, you shall not exceed 25 miles per hour or 40 kilometers per hour. In the day that thou doest that, uh, thou shalt surely be stopped by the state patrolman, uh, and uh, you will will pay a ticket. <laughs> Very bad thing. You pay a fine for for doing that. 
uh, that's a good law because I know exactly what I shouldn't do. <laughs> and as long as laws are uh, a prohibition of a specific thing, then I'm free to do everything else. Uh, when when law gets obscure and strange and uh, odd, uh, then nobody knows how to enforce it. Nobody knows how to avoid doing it. You know, here in this country, we're uh, we've been in the uh, the rather unpleasant conversation for several years now, of trying to decide what an insurrection is, uh, and uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the Congress uh, in our country after the Civil War knew exactly what an insurrection was. They just lived through it. Uh, and uh, uh, many hundreds of thousands of people died during that really terrible Civil War. Uh, and uh, nobody wanted to go through that again. So they uh, made, a, uh, made a rule that uh, the Confederate leadership uh, could not have a part in the future government of uh, the United States. Uh, and it was later on repealed uh, by yet another amendment to the Constitution. But today we've got some uh, uh, we've got some folks who are trying to keep one of the candidates for president from running because he uh, claimed that the previous election was uh, 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 was uh, uh, fraudulent. Uh, which is actually two, and so I guess that that's true. I, I, I suppose that makes me a insurrectionist also. But the fact is, we we haven't defined the word insurrection very well at all. We don't know what we're supposed to avoid. A good law is clear, and for Adam and Eve, there was one law. There weren't ten commandments, just one. But the other commandments that we're going to see in Exodus were in fact uh, uh, understood here in the Garden of Eden. So life is from God, it's sacred. Therefore, you shouldn't murder. Everything that you need is right here. You should be content, you don't need to covet. Uh, you shouldn't steal because everything that you need is right here. Uh, marriage is sacred. We should honor mother and father. We should not commit adultery. There is one God, the maker of heaven and earth, and him alone we should worship. We don't need idols because we are made in the image of God. You see, all of these things fit together. Uh, and the, uh, the original principles are laid out right here in the Garden of Eden. Uh, and we're going to find that spelled out in more detail as we go along. Uh, then uh, finally, and, and I've emphasized this, but I'll, I'll hit it again. Uh, fundamental natural law is set up in the garden. Uh, it doesn't have to be spelled out because it is obvious to anyone who looks. Uh, for example, there are two sexes, uh, male and female. And the idea is uh, for the blessing of mankind, it is simply, it's a more interesting world when there are boy type people and girl type people. Uh, it, it, it just is. Uh, uh, men and women think differently, they act differently, they're built differently. Everything is different. And yet uh, we, uh, work together very well. And when we make the covenant relationship of marriage and begin to produce children, we, we realize what this is all about. Uh, and that, that natural law is visible simply by observation. This is not a religious law. Uh, it, it isn't optional uh, or some kind of dogma that we're forced into taking because we're religious people is simply true. Uh, if, uh, if, you've got, uh, uh, if you've got one snake, you're just out of luck if you want more. But if you add another snake who happens to be the opposite gender, uh, then you've got a potential for making an unlimited number of snakes. That's the way it works. 
Right. And uh, kids who grow up in the country seem to understand this better than city people. I don't know. Maybe maybe city kids grow up thinking the babies come from hospitals. I don't know. Uh, but it often comes as a big surprise to them when uh, when they discover that uh, uh, stuff happens when you when you mess around and um, break the basic propositions. So they. Uh, the binary nature of uh, mankind uh, is is not a bug. It's not something we need to fix. This is this is a feature, and it's true, uh, as so many of these things are, whether or not we like it. Um, and a lot of people today don't like it. They don't like the idea that uh, some laws are uh, natural. They are as old as nature itself. As we get further along, we're going to find out that many of these key principles are in fact a part of the creation set of principles. We'll see how that works as we go on. Okay, I'm gonna end up with the Noahic Covenant, which is a fascinating thing. Uh, this really starts way back in, Genesis 8 goes all the way through Genesis 9, long section here. And there's some uh, interesting things going on. This is supposed to be a, uh, a model of Noah's Ark. I, I think an artist did this, but it, whatever. You know, set up on the uh, mountains of Ararat. And I don't know how, how much this looks like Ararat. It looks more like uh, Nevada to me. But at any rate, here, here's Noah's Ark up on a mountain, uh, uh, Noah and his family came off the ark and the animals spread out uh, and uh, began to repopulate the earth. And uh, uh, God looked back on this uh, bad time, uh, the period of uh, uh, probably 1,500 years between the creation and the flood, maybe as long as 2,000 years. Uh, the uh, uh, the biblical passages are not completely clear on that, and we've got some textual issues. It doesn't matter. A couple of thousand years between the creation and the flood, during which time there was no there was no government. Uh, God simply left people to their own consciences, uh, and after a while, uh, every thought of the intention of his heart was only evil continually. Uh, and it just got worse and worse. And so the flood happened. Uh-oh. Uh if you've got uh, uh, my picture there, you're going you're gonna to see uh, our, little, our little cat, Figaro. Hello, Figaro. Yeah, down you go. You can get down now. Yeah, you're, you're a big boy. After the flood, out comes Noah. And this confrontation with God includes an unconditional promise and a series of stipulations, statements of the covenant obligations that uh, mankind would have from this time on. Uh, this is actually the, the first fully developed biblical covenant. All of the parts are here. Uh, so you, you see the, uh, the I will uh, stuff going on and you see the uh, uh, the uh, the various uh, uh, blessings and curses, the uh, the stipulations, uh, the obligations that come with the uh, uh, with the covenant. Uh, so in this one, we see uh, God. The end of uh, chapter eight, beginning of verse twenty one. Uh, he promises a continuation and a stability of the natural processes until the end of the earth. In other words, uh, the earth will end, but until that happens, uh, all of the processes will be normal, predictable. Uh, so day and night, evening and morning, sun's gonna go down, sun's gonna come up. Actually, the earth rotates, but you didn't need that. Uh, and the springtime and harvest and summer and winter, everything will come in its order and the stars will rotate in the heavens and be predictable. Uh, 
the uh, non-Christian world notices the predictability of nature uh, and says, therefore, that catastrophic, uh, catastrophic things, sudden, unrepeatable events never happen. And so the creation couldn't have happened because everybody knows that everything goes on normally. Uh, uh, Peter says, know this, that in the end, mockers will come saying, where is the promise of his coming? That is the end of the age. Since everything continues as it has since the beginning of creation. Well, it it didn't. Uh, Peter says, uh, there, you, you fool, don't you know uh, that there was a flood? A catastrophe wiped out the entire population of the earth, except for those who accepted the grace of God. So very interesting. Uh, uh, it's a, a, a very important bit here. So we'll look in here. Uh, God says that it's going to it's going to go forever until it doesn't anymore, which time eternity will begin. And it makes it clear that the flood catastrophe is not something normal. We shouldn't look for a a biblical scale flood every couple of years. Uh, the uh, climate catastrophists of the modern world uh, who believe that uh, uh, all of the islands of the sea will be covered up with water uh, sometime soon uh, are making it up as they go along. They really don't know. And God has promised that that wouldn't happen. Uh, so the, the flood catastrophe uh, is one of a kind. It's not normal. Uh, it's a unique episode of the wrath of God. Uh, and also that there is another episode of wrath at the end of history that will result in the destructions of the heavens and the earth and their replacement by a new and finally eternal heavens and earth. So we're in a process here, uh, and we're in the middle of uh, uh, this thing that's going on. Secondly, God provides a blessing. Uh, in uh, 9, 1 through 3. Uh, he, he blesses uh, uh, the people getting off the ark. Uh, he uh, uh, promises that uh, things will be okay. Uh, he uh, uh, gives them the obligation to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. Now, those obligations were also given to Adam and Eve. And so in a way, Noah and his wife and his family uh, have a kind of a new Eden. Only this time, it's a well and thoroughly judged Eden. Uh, the potential is there. Uh, but uh, Noah and his sons and their wives are going to have to start from scratch. Uh, and they've got the uh, obligation to be fruitful. Let's have lots of children here, big families. Let's multiply, encourage our children to marry and have big families. And uh, uh, we're going to fill the earth. Uh, and that's a good thing. It's uh, uh, the, the modern uh, World Economic Forum, uh, Forum or whatever they call it, WEF. Uh, a bunch of uh, elitist uh, uh, dictators uh, would like the population of the earth to decline by 80%. And of course, that means most of us. <laughs> you, you can bet that uh, uh, you and I are not going to find a place on the uh, World Economic Forum arc <laughs> when it sails. Uh, you know, the, the spaces will be fairly limited and uh, uh, they've got a space already reserved, and they they don't like the lower classes. You know, there won't be room in steerage for us. Uh, strikingly, uh, God uh, includes an obligation to institute capital punishment. Capital punishment is the death penalty. Uh, and God specifically says that there in verse 6 uh, that uh, if a man uh, murder, not, not just, uh, this isn't talking about the government imposing capital punishment or uh, the, the military uh, doing what it has to do in a war. 
uh, if it's a just war and you're in it, uh, then what you're doing is not murder. Uh, but if a man unlawfully takes human life, by man shall his life be taken or his blood be shed, literally. Uh, that's capital punishment. Uh, and God doesn't say what we have to do. He doesn't say uh, you need to have a king who will order the execution or, or uh, you ought to put together a posse and chase him down and hang him from a tree. Um, but you have to figure out a way to make this happen when it's necessary. And at first, the oldest thing we see in the Bible is uh, an avenger of blood. A close family relative uh, will take on the obligation of chasing down the murderer and avenging his dead relative. Uh, and that would be a case of vengeance. Uh, that's a hard thing. It's a hard concept. Uh, nevertheless, it's biblical. And this... Um, uh, this obligation for capital punishment uh, is the foundation of human government. The bearing of the sword, Paul tells us in Romans 13, uh, is the one actual obligation that God gives to human government. Uh, most all of the stuff that modern human governments do is not God-ordained. But capital punishment is. So as I find it fascinating that the one thing that most human governments would like to be rid of is capital punishment. And you can't. Uh, if you're going to maintain a stable society, you have to punish um, the worst of crimes with the worst of punishment. Uh, it's, just, uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, so human society needs to, must honor the sanctity of life by taking the life of murderers. Uh, and on a large scale, that would be military action against a criminal state, uh, which is the only real you know, form of just war. So in testament of, uh, of his promises here, uh, that everything is going to be normal and you as a human society are going to be responsible for uh, maintaining the stability of society, God offers the rainbow. Rainbows happen naturally uh, when uh, the clouds thin after a rain and sun shines through the water droplets. You get a, uh, a, a disruption of the, or a, a diffraction of the light through the water droplets, and it makes a rainbow. And it's really pretty. Uh, everybody likes a rainbow. Uh, and it's important, frankly, for us to recognize that the rainbow is a symbol of the gracious promise of God. It's not a symbol of the LGBTQW SS plus or whatever. I don't know what they what all they're demanding these days. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with that. They have um, uh, they have grabbed our symbol. The rainbow is an important symbol. It's a, a, a symbol of God's providence. Another big word. God will continue in a stable fashion to provide all that we need on earth. Uh, it's an important, uh, important idea. Uh, the um, rainbow probably had never appeared before, and we don't know exactly why. Maybe there were always clouds. We just don't know. But some have suggested that. Uh, the rainbow and the clouds is just a reminder that God has promised never to destroy again with a flood. Uh, and uh, uh, some comics have suggested that God was crossing his fingers <laughs> to say, I didn't say I wouldn't destroy the earth with a fire. <laughs> Just a flood. That's the only, only thing that's not. Uh, at the end, the universe will, in fact, uh, disappear in intense heat and fire. Uh, God will make it all go away and recreate an entire new heaven and earth. 
And the, uh, the flood is a great example of that. Okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna close this if I can figure out how. We'll stop with, uh, with Noah and uh, we'll, we'll go on uh, uh, from here next time. Now the next two weeks, two Wednesdays we're going to miss the third Wednesday from now. And I don't know, it'll be the last Wednesday in October. Uh, is uh, our next time together. Let me look at my, at my, no. But yeah, the 25th of October is the next time we'll be here. Okay, and uh, I'm liable to be a little groggy at, uh, at showtime, uh, but I will be here and I will be looking for all of you. Uh, uh, folks, it's, uh, uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I'm looking forward very much to uh, to seeing all our friends uh, in uh, the Philippines, uh, perhaps later this year or next year, whenever we, whenever we can uh, get the funding together. Uh, uh, we'd like to come back to Italy too. Uh, especially, I'd like to uh, to see the churches in the north. Uh, but uh, for now, God bless and uh, bye bye. Love you all. We we'll look forward to the next time we get yeah, together. Sure. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, Dr. John. Ciao. Ciao, Roger. Bye-bye. Happy See you, Oscar. See you next week. See you at the airport. See you next week. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.